Hannah, thank you so much for coming on. Um, you're a crazy cyclist. Uh, you love two shots of coffee before your races. Mm -hmm. Done a PhD in well-being. Um, that's my sum up of you, but I guess for people that yeah, don't know you, tell us a bit about yourself. Mm, well, I apologize to anyone listening to this right now because my stomach is like rumbling, <laughs> even though I literally just ate. Um, do you want me to talk to you or to the camera? Don't me, me. Okay, cool. Yeah. I, so uh, usually I feel like um, Rolly from 101 Dalmatians who's just like, Mom, can I have some more food? I'm hungry. <laughs> Constantly eating. Um, but I am training 20, 25 hours a week on the bike and in the gym. And uh, the, goal is, the goal is Tokyo Paralympics, which is end of August, beginning of September. Uh, after, So the Paralympics is four weeks after the Olympics. Um, tr traditional standard joke is that, you know, the Olympics is the warm-up. Mm. for the Paralympics um, and so that's all pretty intense was out on the bike did 90k this morning it was just an easy roll uh, but then also we did a race yesterday around Hanging Rock which was beautiful had 122 women doing this handicap race which I reckon is you know pretty close to some world records of some description um, so that's taking up a fair fair amount of chunk of time um, and then I'm also uh, doing some really cool stuff at the state emergency service in community connections, recognizing that um, we can help build resiliency through uh, making stronger connections in our communities and how can we support that from a state emergency service perspective uh, and start creating conversations around, you know, really easy things that anyone can do to help make their home a little bit safer for when you know, a storm hits or we have hailstones mm. that destroy millions of cars. <laughs> we had a few days ago, I reckon, I think yeah. from memory. Yeah. <laughs> if anybody needs a tip, apparently you just go out and chuck a blanket over your car um, because usually, you know, you're not too aware. You, you'll know a storm's coming, but mm. that hailstone and how big they are, that component of things yeah, is always... Yeah, the big golf ball size one. Yeah, far out. I don't know if you saw the videos, but no. insane, yeah. insane. Um, one of the guys actually in this complex had his car written off, unfortunately. Um, but enjoying working there and I feel really privileged to work there. They're really supportive of all my cycling and, um, I work part time so I can fit everything in. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Cause yeah, one of the reasons, I mean, this show is all about peak performance and one of the reasons I really wanted to get you on was to talk about the Paralympic stuff and, and yeah. your, you being an athlete. Yeah. Um, but I also, um, am more, I'm also just as interested in the community PhD stuff that you did there. So let's go into that a little bit. Um, yeah, sure. what did you, what was your PhD on? And then, yeah, what did you find through that, which has led you to what you're doing now? Yeah. So I, it all started, <laughs> uh, I finished my double degree in sports science, sport management through Deakin. And then it was just like, I'm going to have my gap year. Cause I didn't have that after, after school. Cause I went and I trained and competed in, I don't know, some swimming world championships or something. Uh, so I went and did that and was hoping to have an epiphany of what the hell should I do next? Uh, you know, young 20s and it's just mm. like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life right now. Um, and during that year off that I had, I mean, I did cycle around Europe and it was great and I had hip surgeries, etc. Yeah. And during that time, I entered a competition and it was, in 25 words or less, tell us one of your happiest moments and you could win tickets to this wellbeing conference. And so I spoke about the first time I ever got my wet leg and I was able to walk into the sea, the beach, the water at Bondi Beach um, and how special that was because before that it had been, you know, horrible, like crutches and wheelchairs and piggybacks, etc. cetera, um, and the beach had never been a fun place. But when I got that leg, it was just life-changing. So I talked about that and I ended up winning the tickets and I went there and – I was listening to these uh, ridiculously amazing people in terms of from so many different disciplines. You had like neuroscientists and philosophers and Buddhist monks and 
Tibetan monks and positive psychologists and I was introduced in that conference to things like mindfulness and um, perma models so how can we enhance our life through positive emotions and relationships and meaning and blah 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 Um, so I was like these are my people Mm. and it's so special when you like find and you feel like you're connected this is like I'm meant to be here right now so that was the start of the PhD journey and I didn't want to be a psychologist um I, I hats off to them in terms of you know that the analogy is they help people who have already fallen off the cliff whereas I would like to let's build people up so that they don't get to the cliff and fall off in the first place mm. um so more of a preventative approach so that's what we looked at in terms of um, well-being and then we narrowed it down to athlete well-being because that's, you know, love sport, etc. Yeah. Um, and we literally looked at defining, measuring it and then improving it. And we improved it through a, a mindfulness intervention along with a few other different uh, techniques, which are long and boring, so we won't bore everyone. Mm. But it was it was only a pilot, but it was still successful, which was really exciting. And, and more importantly, I I got um, some really practical skills out of that PhD. So I gained my teacher qualification in mindfulness and um, all of those other a lot of different other skill sets. So it was awesome, and mm. um, there's still a lot like. A lot more research to be done in this space because we're only just kind of scratching the surface. Yeah, so athlete well-being and it's really topical at the moment. You and I think the conversation around mental health as well is yeah. becoming a lot better. Um, a lot of AFL football players coming out at the moment and saying, "I'm taking some time off for mental mm. health." Mm. And it's interesting because you'd think that an athlete has it all, you know, <laughs> and that's the perception, mm. I guess. And and when Someone comes out like like Dane Beams, who's an amazing story, mm. says, this is what I struggled with and this mm. is my problems. And so how much of that is, is related to, to your what you've been seeing and, and well-being? And yeah. Is that connected? Massively. Mm. Like it's all, all interconnected. And there's been a really helpful shift, I think, in terms of the past couple of years and our ability to talk about mental health um, and normalizing that. It's... Uh, we've still got a long way to go, um, but it, there's this perception that athletes are, you know, superheroes um, and that they don't bleed per se. <laughs> but if we look at the statistics, athletes have the same or higher rates of mental illness than the general population. Um, and that's things to do with perfectionism and burnout and eating disorders uh, and then also when you transition out of sport because you're coming from this environment where uh, you're literally told when to train, how to train, what to eat, how to think, how to sleep. <laughs> it's a very controlled environment, <laughs> very structured. Structured and, and easy. Very structured and there's yeah. a lot of support. Um, but then you kind of finish that and that all fades away and then it's just like, oh, the world's a little bit chaotic. Mm. <laughs> And you've got some big identity shifts as well that you've got to go through. Um, So it's critical to the, the, you know, cliche of not putting all your eggs in the same basket. Um, So, like, who are you as a person? What do you stand for? What gets you excited? What do you want to – what else are you passionate about? Um, I mean, yes, it might be sport, but is it also – is it coaching or is it, you know, community work? Is it food? Is it et cetera, et cetera? So how can we – um channel energies into into different areas and maintain strong connections with you know people inside that sport but also outside your bubble Mm -hmm. as well um so and then for para athletes i mean you know you've got kind of concepts around um i didn't get to explore it enough but micro resiliency and more macro resiliency if we kind of think of it like that so day-to-day basis kind of stuff um that you know an AFL player will get up, they'll have breakfast, they'll go to training, whereas a para-athlete, they'll have to get up, they might have to, you know, change their catheter and then if you've got leg breakdown shit that's happening, you'll have to do some different stuff to help with that and then you'll have breakfast and then if you can drive, you'll drive a modified car but you might have to get an Uber to actually get to training. So Mm. there's kind of the the micro-resiliency for um, para-athletes which can be... 
uh, a strength that uh, helping them to recognize when they are in their sport and it's just like guys you know draw on this um, and that strength that you do have and um, so it was really it was a fascinating couple of years getting to study happiness per mm. se it was not all smiles especially during the st- statistics phase <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you're a numbers person. Oh, yeah I'm not a numbers person <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was just out of necessity yeah you should do it <laughs> Uh, I'm sure Emma, um, so my sister would relate to that even when she was doing her honours. I remember my brother and I, we'd be making too much noise and she'd run into the room being all angry and she was probably on a stats kit. Probably. Probably. (laughs) Sorry, Em. (laughs) Um, I really want to know, yeah, a little bit more about um, that resilience. Obviously, you being a Paralympic a performer and an athlete, you would have that micro and macro resilience mm. as well. But then learning a lot about mental health and mm. and mindfulness, how, mm. how have you even adapted your studies and your work into your overall performance? Have you seen a change, change there? Yeah. Um, I've definitely been on the probably what I would call a standard athlete journey in that you start out and you're very driven by – gold medals uh, and now I'm I'm driven more so by s- internal motivation and self-improvement and mastery of my sport and the skills associated with my sport and but I'm a very competitive person like if you put me in a race then you know I want to beat that mm. person but it's not um, I don't quite get that angry like oh, I'm gonna take him out kind mm. of person uh, they just I used Kathy Freeman and said I, you know, I use competition to draw the best out in me, uh, which I think was a really great way of putting it. Um, So it's been, um, I think these days, you know, you can look at a person's life and be like, oh, you know, they're doing really well. Um, But, you know, life is, it's a tough nut. (laughs) And we all have our own stories and our own struggles that we're fighting with and I've gone through a massive learning curve and I'm still a massive work in progress um of learning to do a little bit less and not taking on too much to the point where I get overwhelmed and I'm just like what have I done I can't cope um and even yeah probably since Friday I've noticed so you change energy levels throughout you know the week and days and um my resiliency levels are quite low right now and I can tell that because, um, you know, your brain says a lot of shit, uh, but it's how much you buy into it. And at the moment I keep buying into it. I'm like, mm. and I've got the skills. Like I can see, I can hear myself thinking that. I'm like, hey, we can take a step back here right now. And I'm like, shut up. I just want to buy into it right now and stop your mumbo jumbo and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. So you have all these funny kind of internal dialogues. Um And, you know, my other key signs, like if you drop your keys and it's the end of the world or somebody cuts you off, it's just like, why me? Mm. (laughs) So, um, you know, you start recognizing, I use the terminology is life kind of, is it giving me a feather right now? Is it giving me a brick or is it giving me a steam train? Like how much do I need to to listen and and take a step back? And, um, but I have, you know, mechanisms in terms of in building at least, 20 minutes to half an hour each day of, of mindfulness or breath work practice, uh, which I think is really powerful and helpful. Um, there's so much, so much research around the physiological effects that are happening when we breathe mm. and we focus on our breath and um, the different ratios of inhale to exhale, how that affects your, your nervous system. Um, And so then therefore the different bodily functions like digestion, um, heart rate, uh, all of your hormones and cortisol levels and these things. Um, And then the different areas of your brain as well when we're practicing mindfulness or breath work or meditation, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, So I think that's all just completely ridiculously amazing. Mm. Uh, I get excited about it. Um. (laughs) Yeah, no, it it is. I mean, I did did meditation for 10 weeks and sadly I – got out of the free trial period of the app that I was using. So okay. I, didn't, I didn't go further, um, which is a disappointment because I was 
seeing the difference um, yeah. in just, I mean, you touched on something there, like someone cutting you off when you're driving yeah. a car, right? <laughs> or you're dropping your keys and it's the end of the world. But the funny thing is, is we all have a choice at that point. Mm. You know, if you drop your keys at the door and then you drop all your shopping and, and now you're a mess, like you've made that choice to be a mess. Like you can just kind of go, oh, well, that sucks. I need to go buy more milk. Like, and I think mindfulness and meditation almost gives you that advantage or go to the person cutting you off. You can get angry and scream and have road rage, but um, which I, I do. I don't call it road rage. I say I have road displeasure. <laughs> 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 Love it. <laughs> so, but still, even that road displeasure isn't yeah. isn't a positive. Like it's not getting me any. Mm. It's not giving me anything positive back. And I think mm. mindfulness and meditation and all these things can just give you that little bit of perspective on things, mm. uh, as it's not the end of the world. Yeah, mm. and even there's a piece in there like if you are grieving or you know, you do have an outburst, you can have that acceptance of the place where you're currently at Mm -hmm. instead of fighting it so much. It's like, okay, I'm really sad right now and I'm crying and that's okay. Um, And allowing yourself to cry and to feel those emotions and then starting to use curiosity to explore, well, where am I sad in my body? Um, What does that look like? What does it feel like? Can I sit, can I breathe around it Mm -hmm. or can I just sit with it? um and just be so yeah there's a lot of things that you know will take for me a lifetime to kind of continue to explore and um because at the end of the day I'm just a human being with all of the same you know traits I get very tired and hungry and need to go Mm -hmm. to the bathroom and I hurt and I grieve but then I also appreciate joy and I have gratitude and I have Mm -hmm. great friends and um all these things so yeah and I think you touched on something also there where I said before like it, there's a perception that athletes have it all and amazing but and then it's it's people think it's it's odd that they also have struggles but I think the counter argument to that is you are you're a human being you, you feel you you know, you have different emotions things happen so I think I was going to ask you like how do we knock down that perception but maybe that's the answer but correct me if I'm wrong yeah no so yeah. it's Mm, one of the key things that came out of my research was, you know, let's look at that person first rather than, so yes, swimming or cycling or football or netball, cricket, that's what a person does, but it's not the person. Um, and time and time again, like we looked at well-being similarities and differences between para-sport athletes and Olympic sp- or a- athletes in Olympic sports, um, athletes in para-sports, athletes who are female, athletes who are male, athletes who are non-binary, all these kind of different things. Um, And time and time again, our similarities always outweigh our differences, Um, which is uh, easy to forget sometimes um, because we're bombarded by so much negativity and advertising. And I find that really energy zapping. So Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, how can we look at that person first and um, what are their strengths, what they enjoy doing, how can we connect, what are mm. our similarities. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, and they'll always human, be lots. Being a human. Yeah. Yeah. And we're called, I love it, this is my cliche mindfulness teacher, but we're called human beings, not human doings. Mm. So just being able to stop and be, um, be in that moment and enjoy what you have right now because – you know, we're reminded, but it doesn't quite hit home usually just how precious life is. Mm. Yeah. yeah well. um, I'd love to now, yeah, touch into um, Hannah, the athlete. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, so how did that come about? How did you choose cycling as your mm. main main thing? And, yeah, obviously Tokyo 2020, really cool um, benchmark and, and goal yeah. to go for. Um yeah, take me, I guess, to the start. I've, I've never really I've known you for a few years now, your yeah. sister coming over and all that, but <laughs> I've never actually asked you the question, yeah, how did you get started in it? And then when did you switch to be like, wow, okay, I can I can make this a... <laughs> this is me. This is me, <laughs> yeah. Um, so my friends like to remind me that I was the fastest runner in grade one. I don't remember this fact, but they remind me and I believe them. 
I, but always like quite sporty as a kid um, and just went through your traditional learn to swim programs and as part of school sport, my sport teacher encouraged me to go into zones and then to state championships for swimming um, and I ended up getting a, a medal at that state championships in 50 meter freestyle and that was I was just like, huh, hmm. I'm not too bad at this. Uh, and so then, you know, I had had the, I'd said out loud the year before to my mum um, when I was getting a leg made, there was a picture of a wall of a guy with one leg, three massive gold medals around his neck, had the caption Paralympian. And I'm like, that's me. <laughs> uh, so then it's like, okay, well, how can I make this a reality? for swimming and so working through, you know, getting coaches and et cetera and then started travelling with the Australian team in 2001, uh, went over to Phoenix, Arizona, which was a, a massive trip for a 13-year-old um, yeah. to start travelling with the team by by yourself. Um, um, they looked after me really well. Of course. So, yeah. uh, and then progressed from there in terms of, you know, World Championships and Paralympic Games in swimming mm -hmm. for 04 and 08, Athens and Beijing. Um, and got to the point, though, where I was really burnt out from swimming. Um, that black line yeah. doesn't change no. a whole lot. <laughs> uh, so I literally just looked at, uh, you know, Still want to go to the Paralympics. What other sports can I do? Um, process of elimination in terms of uh, currently, because I haven't trained it a lot um, and I'm not no natural talent in terms of ball sports and catching things. Mm -hmm. um, my leg's quite long and skinny, so I get stress fractures quite easily at this point in time with mm -hmm. the technology available. Um, so running was kind of out as well. And it just pretty much boiled down to cycling and rowing. And rowing was another early morning water-based sport and was just like... Let's want to get away. <laughs> well, yeah, want to get away from water. Yeah. 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 Mind you, cycling, especially this week, has been an early morning water-based sport. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, but, you do live in Melbourne. <laughs> I um, do live in Melbourne. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I found it and I loved it. Oh. Absolutely loved it. It's um, it's freedom. I was going to say. to be on the bike. I was going to say because you were talking about the beach and being able to go in the water and that giving mm. you a sense of freedom, but then being on the bike where it's you can you can go anywhere like you were saying mm. before ninety k's you did yeah so ninety k's from here is I don't know I mean it's definitely from here to Hoppers Crossing uh, like, <laughs> uh, I'm just putting that in probably here to Hoppers Crossing and back and again, back I would say. Yeah, definitely um, I, I don't know so what was the distance uh, uh, I don't know for people listening on just to give context on 90 kilometers yeah how far would we have to go from say the CBD Melbourne CBD yeah how far could we go with, with 90 k? um you're probably talking almost to Sorrento yeah, wow. Well, um, if you were that's around the bay. one line. Oh, uh, as, a, as a crow flies or that's uh, around, around the bay? Probably around the bay, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this morning we just rode to Frankston and back and did yeah. some laps between Morty and Black Rock. Um, but, yeah, it's easily down to the Mornington Peninsula, Penins Peninsula mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from the CBD. Um, so it's probably CBD to Geelong, maybe. Mm. Wow. Um, yeah, so... It's funny because it's become my normal. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, I just did 90K this morning. Everybody else is like, what? <laughs> but it's normal for you. Like, yeah. I've got a mate who he really got into cycling as well, and every every weekend he's putting up his cycling picks. Mm. And what I love about cycling and, and you being in teams of cycling is mm. the community around mm. it as well. So people are passionate about it. You can, you can probably talk about your bike for hours on end um, and, and to another cyclist <laughs> as well about micro things. Um, but, yeah, tell me about that community because that feeds back into what we were talking about before mm. with mental and because, and yeah, we know being around people, we're social animals, even if you are mm. introverted, Definitely. being with people. So how much has that community really helped you? Massive. Yeah. Absolutely massive. Like they've been so welcoming um, and... So yesterday, like 122 women in the race, and it was beautiful in the sense that a handicap is where you work together for most of the race until the last couple of kilometers, um, and then it's balls on. But uh, 
it wasn't, it was such a beautiful thing to be a part of because we were encouraging each other. Um, you know, if we passed a rider that had been, uh, dropped from the group in front of us and, um, we'd be like, oh, try get on if you can. And, uh, it was just really beautiful to be a part of. And you've got the, I think a few elements of cycling in that, um, you're outside, which I think is critical for mm. mental health. Um, you're riding side by side with somebody, which is less confrontational. Um, so it's really easy to have a conversation when you're sitting next yeah. to somebody and you're not like eyeballing them the whole time. <laughs> Um, so it can be really powerful to help have different and, and courageous conversations. Um, and then also you've got the, the physical aspect of you pushing your body. Um, so that's really helpful for physical and mental health. Mm. Um, and then you've got the tradition of sitting down and having a coffee afterwards and, um, reminiscing and savoring and talking about, you know, what's coming up. And so all of those helpful things that, feed into into well-being um and then you've also got the the satisfaction of challenging yourself and you know did it go well did it not go well how can i learn how can i get better um so it's pretty bloody awesome yeah very cool (laughs) um i'd love to get into the peak performance aspect of that so um again what um what events are you doing are you the the velodrome cyclist you road cycling what what yeah so i do um road cycling cycling. and i do time trial on the road yep so i'm in my aero position um with my aero helmet and um my disc wheels so all of these things getting like a percentage or so yeah you know difference Like your skin suit that you wear is important where you're holding your head and where you're looking and even to the point of your hand position. Um, And they don't love it that I used to be a swimmer because my shoulders are so big. (laughs) So like, Hannah, get your shoulders smaller. (laughs) Um, And then down to like tire pressure, um, what tires you're using, uh, and then strategy in terms of for the race, uh, so you've got the course, but then you have variables on the day in terms of, well, what are the weather conditions like? Where's the wind coming from? Um, and then that impacts your race strategy of, uh, you know, you can make up more ground going a little bit harder into the wind uh, rather than if you've got a tailwind behind you, mm-hmm. um, it's harder to make up more ground, etc. cetera. Um, so... To the point of, you know, you've got booty covers. We make sure we have shaved legs. Mm. Um, Some people shave their arms. Uh, What you eat um, is really important. I mean, caffeine is a just standard kind of um, supplement in in cycling, (laughs) but as well as things like beetroot juice. Um, they want, I will start using a little bit of creatine for gym cool. um, to help build up, up a bit more muscle. Uh, but I've been banned now from all arm exercises. <laughs> because of the swimming. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, and it's all – so my coach, you know, we work out um, specific training sessions that will then – uh, support me to be able to perform at my best for the specific race that we've got coming up. So if you know that you've got a course where you've got a hill for three minutes and then you've got some flat for, you know, a couple of K and you've got some technical descent after that. Um, so literally your training efforts will be, okay, we're going to start off and we'll do a two minute effort at that power that we want to hold. And then mm-hmm. you're going to have to back it up with 10 minutes at steady state, like threshold. Yeah. Um, so it's all very specific to specific. the one to that yep. course so you'll look at so say tokyo 2020 for example you'll have a fair bit of time now to know what that course is a little bit yeah so we've um we're really lucky uh um working with full gas which is a company um so they've gone and filmed the tokyo course wow. And then you sit on your, your ergo, your wind trainer, stationary bike, um, and you've got your computer or your TV screen and you pull up the course. And then because we have power meters and heart rate sensors and cadence and etc. cetera. Um, so using all of that data, it can plot how fast you would be going around the course and what positioning. And um, so it makes it really lifelike. Wow. 
Uh, so we can go in and use that technology, which mm. is just, you know, that's a godsend. Is that using VR? Do they put VR um, in Not, quite, not yet. quite yet. But that's, I, I assume it's coming. Work in progress. Yeah. It's coming. I've played a little bit with it. Um, it's ridiculously exciting. It's insane as well. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it's coming. Yeah. It's coming. Very cool. So. Talking about tech, oh, and this, is, this will be quite funny. Um just thought of this. So my sister's honors project was to do a GPS unit tracking. Yep. Um, just got to give Emma a shout out here. And, and she did a lot of work on that. But how do you guys use GPS data um, in your training? Is it just a base level? Um, probably a little bit differently to team sports. Yep. And um, oh, that's fine. But, yeah, I, I yeah, mean, Phil, but yeah. traditionally, um, you know, our bike computers will track the terrain and so yeah how many meters you're gaining in terms of altitude or descending um obviously kilometers at speed etc um so then it helps you to monitor your training load um and if you're doing too much too little we also use hrv so heart rate variability mm -hmm. um to monitor training load and if you're under too much stress etc yeah, um yeah. yeah when to pull back when to go harder uh yeah yesterday i nearly had a heart attack because my heart rate was resting heart rate was 37 and i'm like whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> shite <laughs> um so yeah we probably we use gps data and, and tracking etc in a little bit of yeah, a different way. different way um mainly to monitor it monitor yeah. the training way fair enough yeah um and then i guess the something i'm really fascinated right about because you've got uh, exercise science background that was the first thing you did in sports yeah. management um, how much does your knowledge of that come into play when you're getting a training program, nutrition, all of that? Do you go, oh, I remember learning that? Or, <laughs> <laughs> or do you leave it now to, to those people more so than, than drawing back on your knowledge? Um, I think it's interesting to see, you know, the things that you're taught and how they come into play and how they're brought to life in terms of, so, you know, the easy one is training loads. So we use a basic kind of three weeks on, one week off kind of approach, which seems to work really well. And then your, your micro, um, meso and macro cycles, how they all fit in. Uh, and then, you know, remembering back to the days when you're doing anatomy and physiology and what muscles and it's like, okay, well, that's, you know, flexion versus extension. And then when your strength and conditioning coach is talking about, okay, so, we want a kind of a pushing technique here or a pulling technique and um, they say ridiculously long words but then you break it down and you're like okay so that's you know adduction moving away from the body um, I always remembered that from like you know somebody's being abducted applying you know different things that you learn but it's also um, because I have a few things going on, it's nice to have that trust in my team and I know that they're doing a really good job um, and that I'm in good hands so I don't have to, you know, nitpick or anything yeah. and they're on the they're on the right track. Yeah. Uh, so it's really good in that sense having the trust. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's um, – I'm always, always learning too compared to where I was, you know, 10 years ago when I was doing that sports science degree and – um, there's a lot of stuff I've forgotten because I just haven't used it, but there's a lot of stuff that has been useful as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And that's the same with my degree. Like I've just finished my marketing degree and um, had that done last like yeah. half of last year. And um, But I still read marketing books and yeah. buy different courses and update my knowledge because, yeah, we're always learning, mm. we're always learning, which I think is a luxury as well, but also... Yeah, really cool thing if you can realise that there's always something extra. Definitely. Okay. Um, yeah. I guess I'd, I'd also like to talk if you, you like mentoring people. I know you, you, you've done a lot of talks and, and things. Do you have advice to up-and-coming athletes or peak performers? You know, because there is a level of dedication that needs and commitment. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, talking on that commitment, how have you... Yeah, just gone all in and, I mean, obviously you're passionate about it mm, and that helps, mm. but 
there's got to be days where you don't want to get oh, up. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. how do you push through that? How do you go? No, today I have to get out and do 90 kilometers or 120 kilometers. Um. Did you brush your teeth this morning? Uh, did I? No, I did. I, I brushed them last night. I didn't do it this morning. Oh, but you brushed them yesterday. Yes. Did you have to think about that? Like no. The act of brushing them. No, of course not. No, it's just something you it's do. Just something you do. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and for me, that's where it's got to in terms of what I do. Mm. I don't think about it like it's not a choice mm. of getting out and going. What's on my program? I have to be smart in terms of. If I'm sick, it's like, this is not a good idea right now. Um, but it's to the point where there's not even that question within me of whether I do it or not. It will be done <laughs> um, because I've been doing it for so long. But in terms of, you know, when you're on that upward journey, there's different factors of building in in terms of, what are you committing to? Why are you committing to it? So what's that foundation, those values of supporting it that's important to you? Um, and then uh, the people to support that, uh, support that journey. Um, having So therefore having the accountability to, to someone else, mm -hmm. um, I think is it's massive. Really big. <laughs> Because we'll do, we'll do stuff, we'll do more for other people than we will ourselves. Yeah. So having that other person there, even if it's your parents or your best friend mm. or whatever, to check in and be like, you know, yeah. what's going on? Exactly. Yeah. Um, or a coach being like, you know, this is your training session and this is what you do. And um, so that accountability piece, but then also, you know, kind of that mindset of uh, what are you saying yes to? Um, if you do go out and train, you're saying yes to so many different things, mental health, physical health, blah, 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 coffee. <laughs> <laughs> like we said in the intro, you're like, what is it, two shots of coffee before competition? Yep, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Double shot espresso. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jansen at Citizen Cafe. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's slowly building those habits to make them sustainable to the point where you're not diverting cognitive resources to having to make that decision. Mm -hmm. um, it's just part of what part you do. Part of what you do. Yeah. yeah. Like these polo tops, for example. I mean, this is a low-level example of this, but I've bought like 20 of these mm -hmm. so that every day I just know I'm like that's what I'm wearing. So decision yeah. fatigue yep. doesn't become yep. a thing. Yeah. Like it's a little, yeah. you know. Little no, life hacks. Little life hacks. <laughs> hey, cool. Um, I think it's a really cool spot to end it on, Sweet. actually. Um, cool. But I've got two more questions. Uh, obviously, we talked about Tokyo, but it, the question would be what's coming up for you yeah. that you're really excited about, and, and that would be mm. the natural answer. So, that yeah, that question. Yeah, um, so as we were talking about before, I'm the dark horse for Tokyo. Australia needs to qualify six spots for me to be able to go, and we won't know that until mid-June. Um, when everything's finalised in terms of all your countries get allocated the spots and um, there's a whole it's close? Is there, there people that are up and coming that you that will fill that spot? Like how is, uh, it, or is it hard to tell? So there's five other girls who are ranked ahead of me at the moment cool. in different classes and different yep. events, track and road. Uh, the tricky thing is that I believe and my coach really believes um, – Tokyo, the course for Tokyo, the time trial plays to my strengths and so that I could do really well on that course. But it's, you know, we've got girls who are the world record holder, um, world champion in their respective um, events. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's going to be super tough. Um, I can only control what I can control mm. and that's how fast I go and um, the training that I put in and the things that I eat and how much sleep I get, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, but Tokyo would be absolutely freaking amazing yeah like i'm actually oh. going to extend the episode now but i realized we didn't even talk much on tokyo so i'm going to ask some more questions if that's okay don't know how much i know about tokyo no. itself but no, i but can try the, yeah tell me about your mindset going into that and like you, you'll just have so much more passion around your training even though you have passion around your training mm. already but just that there's this big goal there mm. how's that affecting um it just gives you a massive sense of purpose yeah uh and 
but it also helps you break down your training as well. So if you set yourself a goal, um, and that's why it's useful to have an event or something that you are working towards because it's this big thing and then you break it down into literally day by day, how do we achieve that? Um, and that creates direction and momentum for your life. Uh, but Tokyo itself, like they've had the facilities ready for a long time. Um, it'll be similar time zone for us. So TV will be great viewing for Aussies, uh, which will be fantastic. And it's just so rich in culture and they've got a really strong sense of connection. Like they have pros and cons with their communities and mental health and suicide, etc. Um, and working, blah, blah, blah. Mm. But there's a lot too that we can learn from their strengths in terms of well-being, and et cetera. So it'll just be ridiculously awesome. Yeah, very cool. Very yeah. cool. And um, yeah, last one, I guess if people want to follow along the journey and, yeah. and support you, you know, I know there's back in the day 2000 or something, there was a big support campaign for Olympians and, you know, send messages, support, like it really helps, mm. I, I think. But if people want to follow the journey along, you know, Paralympic Instagram or whatever, um, mm. yeah, how do people sort of follow you yeah, the so journey if they want to? I'm on Instagram. Cool. Um, handmacdougal 6 and I've got my own website as well. I blog occasionally. Um, from a well-being perspective, I shut down my Facebook athlete page and my okay. tour account just to keep things simple. I'm like, which ones do I enjoy using the most and how do I connect the yep. most with people? Yep. Um, so that's working well. Um, yeah, so jump on Instagram or my website. Cool. I'll put the links to that in the show Thank notes. You. And awesome. the website, of course, I'm sure you've got some really good content there on well-being. So if people want to yeah. yeah, go and learn how to be a peak performer and have wellness at the front of their mind, go on check out the website beautiful thanks cool. much Lee. awesome hannah i've been tim you've been hannah we've been talking and thank you pleasure thank Cheers. you my friend <laughs>